like I've worked up with Maria Martinez, knowing that I might want to do a presentation at Antigua in 2018. Uh, I flew out from New York, and because I was such a long distance, I thought two weeks were better than one week. So I will go through the firing method. We'll go through. Is there a way to get a picture going there? Okay. We'll go through the firing method and um, warming method and all that we can see up there. I can't see from here, though. Anyway, uh, Maria was, was about n in her late 90s at the time of the workshop. We weren't sure because when your birth certificate was like a reservation. But she was joined by um, her son, Adam, her granddaughter, Barbara, and her uh, daughter, Martha Santana, who also helped facilitate the workshop, which was really helpful. Uh, to begin with, they used a pitchy, a little uh, a shallow dish that you put a pancake with a tray on, and you can move it around as it's warming to this heat. Um, here you see Maria and Santana doing the work there. And then you make coils. And a lot of us roll out coils flat on a table, but they did perfectly made coils by kind of rolling in their hands and having them drop down. Some people put pipes on top of it, but others really did. But once the coils are made, they're attached to the piece of clay on the pitchy, and it moves around as they're forming the clay, pinching it, making the pot bigger, thinner, and then eventually forming it. It's all one piece, it's all wet clay. Uh, then they shape and smooth it with a piece of board. And here you see Maria, she's shaping the, the piece of the pot out of the pitchy. It's formed, it's, it's kept damp, it's moist, and she's continued to form it. I have to say they were all uh, perfectly even uh, with this method and their skill. And then once the pot is completely dry, we, we go to the hardware store and get sandpaper, and we lightly sand the piece and get it ready for a final slip. And the slip is burnished, um, and I'm sure a lot of you know about burnishing. It is um, with a stone. Maria loaned me her stone, so I was able to burnish my pot beautifully. Uh, but once it's burnished, um, you put the Crisco oil with the slip, and you have to go to the supermarket to get the Crisco oil. And then um, we get this beautifully burnished pot, and then we need a second slip to paint on it um, to form the mat that goes on top of the stone mat. So that's the black for black. So it's a black stone mat with a black mat that causes the decoration. And at the beginning of the workshop, we all did yucca brushes that we chewed for a day. And by the end of the day, they were ready to be snipped to be the right uh, length for the width for painting on. I think Susie's on bamboo brush here, but traditionally it's a yucca mat. This is a workshop that did yucca decorating. Um, firing the pot. Um, they're placed on a grate and with uh, materials such as wood and pine needles and things like that. And two types of, well, manure and cow dung are used. Sometimes buffalo chips are used. And then to get the black on black, we have to make um, a, a container to take out all the oxygen, as I'm sure you know. Here's building the snow. It's in the driveway of the Lido Bar. It happened to be the parking lot. And a lot of people showed up for the fire. The bus loads of people came. And uh, it's all snap and pictures and things like that. But here is the grate being made. These, are, This is after a week of workshop. We did about a dozen of us in the workshop. Um, these are the pots with which we make clay. The white is the mat slip. And then the pots are added to. And you can see from what she's done so far, the, the mat has didn't just stack the pieces. And what was interesting is everything came out great. It wasn't there was a special clay piece torn. And one of the things that I noticed, which really makes the piece crack or break later, the black gets all the way through the pot. And I've tried to replicate this at home. Um, you know, it's just the surface of the mat, but the entire piece is black. Uh, there's two times that the, the, uh, the process is blessed. One when they collect the clay and they mash the clay, and the second was at the firing, which is with Columbia. And you can see the cow patties that are entirely around the, um, the firing. And we lit the fire. And at this point, 
a busload of people that come in, taking pictures of Maria. I happen to be sitting next to her, and she turns to me and says, you let them take a picture, maybe they'll buy a car. So she <laughs> runs her ego to the station wagon and will pretty uh, with it. Um, she gets the, and the, the movie actually incorporates some other the, the uh, horse manure. And, and as I'm sorry, I don't mean to get on a bit on this exposition. The coal fire in six, uh, two hours was a pretty difficult process. I was thrilled because I was doing the whole bus thing and making up figures for the whole thing. And between the time um, there was a, a gallery opening down in Claremont, California, and um, so I got to see a lot of their work. Um, and here's a, a, a painting of Tobin, one of her pieces. You can see the, the traditional feathers around the rim of the, the platter and then the design in the middle. And keep in mind, she probably made with a yuck tray. Just absolutely exquisite. Somebody grabbed my pen. <laughs> I'm glad they did. I didn't remember I had this picture, but you know that's the noisy thing with them. But but anyway, I was thrilled to be able to share it with you. And I just got this junkie. Uh, this is one of my early workshops that I took, and it was just an awful exquisite piece. So thank you for asking me. I hope I didn't get on with this. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Rachel Clark. Um, I'm a third year grad student at East Carolina University. Can you hear me a little louder, please? Yeah, can you guys hear me better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Uh, so for the past year, I've been developing a method that I'm calling oxide fusion printing. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to this new method. It's significant as a new form of imagery <laughs> and its application on some of my work. So what makes this method different from other image applications? Lasers, <laughs> so lasers are neat. But why would I go through the hassle of creating a new image transfer when we already have so many options? Um, the primary reason I developed this method is to compensate loss. We're gonna get in this after. <coughs> so Scrafito Mishima decals, they all require being heated in a kiln. Um, not only is this more costly, but it increases the production uh, time of the work and the carbon footprint. So this is some of my undergraduate work, three hours of painting loss to a soda kiln brick. Um, another thing I'm combating is loss of my studio time. And <coughs> you guys know that if your atmospheric fires, there's a good chance you're gonna lose something in the kiln. So oxide fusion printing is a method in which a laser is used to pow fuse powdered metal oxide to a ceramic surface. Uh, as I mentioned before, this allows post-firing application of imagery without heating the entire object in the kiln. Uh, this is the Zing Epilog laser. This is what I'm using to develop my method. It's a laser etcher and operates similarly to a printer. Uh, you use a PDF file, that's an image, um, send it to the laser etcher and it prints onto the surface. So laser etchers convert light energy to heat really efficiently. Um, as you can see on the left, there's a microscopic image of the laser etching into glass and on the right, it creates divots instead of a continuous line um, where it's vaporizing part of the material. So my research into metal oxides gave me the background information to experiment with bonding powdered metal oxide to the ceramic material. Um, I can heat metal oxide to the, pow to the point of fusion by adjusting the power and duration of the laser beam. Uh, ceramic glaze can withstand localized increases in temperature up to 3,500 degrees without fracturing, which is pretty cool. So on this slide, you can see um, different metals have different melting temperatures, right? So the oxides are run through a series of the <coughs> They run through a series of successively slower speed settings over power. Um, the oxide inlay is dependent on the melting point of the given oxide in relation to the duration of the laser beam. So the longer the beam is focused, the hotter it becomes. And you can see that the peed over, speed over power setting is consistent with the melting point of each oxide. This is printed onto a porcelain with a clear glaze on it. So before the printing process can occur, a design must be rendered. One of the benefits of oxide fusion printing is that you can use um, digital media. I use my iPad and the Procreate app, and then I can just send it directly to the printer and print it onto the piece. It also allows for uh, 
more complex image manipulation than just drawing directly onto the ceramic. You can also get finer line and detail. Uh, so to apply it, you have to apply the oxide to the surface. So it's gotta be mixed with a vehicle. Um, the vehicle I'm using is isopropyl alcohol, and I use that because it evaporates really quickly. It has a really short working time. So you apply a short, or a even coating of the powder. I'm using a roller, and that creates less ridges. Ridges can affect the print quality. So for this print, I'm using black nickel oxide. Once you apply the oxide to the surface, you put it into the printer bed, um, focus the bed to bring it into the correct focal length for the laser, and then you can send the print through. So before sending the image to the printer, you have to do some adjustments on the laser after. Um, <clears throat> and you have to adjust the correct power setting to the particular oxide that you're using. And I have these sheets if anyone's interested in doing this at home. Just come see me right after the uh, session. So once the image is sent to the etcher, the laser etcher gives, begins printing onto the surface of the piece. Uh, by heating the oxide to the point of fusion, it fuses with the silica, and the printing session typically takes about 2.1 minutes per square inch of detail imagery. So it's not really fast, but it's not, it's not a really slow process. Uh, the process is really efficient. So post-firing, only the uh, <coughs> metal directly affected by the laser is uh, left, and that means that since we use the isopropyl alcohol, you can sweep everything into a collection container and reuse it. That makes the loss of metal oxide almost completely negligible. Super cost effective. So how do we know that the oxide's actually fusing to the silica? Um, I've run them through a lot of tests, including wire brushing, mild acids, um, intense heat, to determine the durability of the print. Uh, the second indicator is that the metal is heated to the point of reduction during the process. So if you look at the two outer prints, those are both shiny, similar to how a um, red copper oxide would look in reduction. And the one in the middle has been re-oxidized. So it's a little bit more matte. It's been exposed to um, heat and absorbed oxygen. So that means that there's enough metal left on this to visually alter it through um, the oxidation process. So since discovering oxide fusion printing, I've experimented with wood-fired stonewares, porcelains. Um, on the next slide, there we go. Both of these guys were printed with red copper oxide and green chrome oxide. So as you can see, you can do it on brown surfaces and you can get some really great detail. And normally if that were on there, that would be completely lost in the wood firing process. Um, I've also experimented with different mid-range clay bodies. And if a clay body has a lower vitrification point, it's a better subject for oxide fusion printing. This is a uh, basaltware cup, and I use black nickel oxide. And that's just the raw clay body, so it gets a really great um, matte gloss contrast. So in conclusion, I've enjoyed exploring this new method of oxide fusion printing. Um, I believe that there's many applications in the studio, and I'm excited to see what developments happen uh, off my research implemented into other studios. If anybody's interested in learning more about this process, I'm more than happy to talk with you after the session. Thank you. My name is Rachel Dorn. I wore a pantsuit on election day. And uh, um, after the election, I was, as many of us probably were, uh, unhappy, upset, uh, disappointed, maybe not entirely surprised. Um, but I, I was very upset. And what surprised me was how that ended up over the course of the year impacting my art making. So I have always worked abstractly. Um, I've been interested in installation, bright colors, lots of texture, mixing media, and my focus has always been, like I said, abstract. I've done some figurative work, but it has never left the house, right? I haven't shown it. So after the election, I called my congressperson and my senators a lot, uh, regularly, and I went to the Women's March, and I went to some Indivisible meetings, and uh, talked with people, 
and went on Facebook perhaps too often. Um, and I, I was just, I, I was upset. I, I wasn't feeling like it was doing enough. Well, I had a show coming up for which I had planned to do this installation piece. Um, and I started having the imagery that was making me upset, like gerrymandering, for example. That one's hard to, hard to read on the side there. Um, this imagery started impacting my work. And I decided that it was reasonable for it to Im Im, you know, influence my work. But I was still really focused on texture and pattern, color, although I've, I've kept the color palette a little more muted. Um, and so I, I started to let this impact the work I was actually doing. And I thought, well, this is similar to what I had been doing already. It's all right. And then I just kept getting frustrated. And I get, got upset, and I was angry. and. I needed that, that political life to impact the work I was doing in the studio. And, and I just couldn't kind of stop it. So uh, I brought in some of the language that was coming from uh, our government, our president. Um, and I brought in some of the imagery that was in the news. And, uh, and of course, you guys have been around for the last year. Uh, the, the news cycle has been moving so quickly that there's new images every day. There's a new thing to be upset about, potentially, every day. And so I started to, or, or I, I increasingly was bringing in this imagery. And at some point, it got to the point where it was, I could no longer pretend that I was being abstract and just bringing in hints of it, right? Um, so the pieces, the, the, the materials, the ideas, the images that I brought in started to come out you know, past the edges of these pieces. And at the first show that I put, that I had, that I had an opportunity to show some of this stuff in a really low stakes um, situation, I realized that a lot of the imagery was very much pointing in one direction. So it was talking to one group of people, probably many of the people who are here today, but the people who go to galleries in a small conservative town. And I started to, I, I you know, my, my aunt who I love, disagrees with me on a lot of political things, and I love her, and she's a wonderful person. And so I started to want to say, okay, are there some places where we all have concerns, but the answer isn't quite so clear? So things that are a little either more ambiguous like that, or things that relate to a particular situation. Now these are, are local, frankly. Um, there's a tent city that happens in our town, a uh, large homeless population, and there's basically a parking lot that fills up with tents in the summer. I'm not sure if the tents communicate entirely clearly on the bulb, but that's where the image was coming from. Language was also something that I was Im reacting to, obviously, in tweets, but also um, people on two sides of this, this issue are, are kind of fighting over the, the Bill of Rights and the amendments. And so I started by pressing the First Amendment um, text into the surface of these bulbs and ended up doing the Declaration of Independence. And we all know the pieces that we argue about, but we don't necessarily read the entire document straight through. And what was really fascinating looking, pressing the text into the pieces was that the words would stretch and bend and twist and be blocked or, or hidden. And you would end up, I ended up focusing differently. You, you notice words that are in that that are kind of uh, not so palatable today. I was still thinking about texture, but the images, the pieces, the ideas were coming from places that were much more literal, much more telling a story. And of course, frustration and uh, feeling I don't know what I can do about, uh, about the situation was coming through as well. And so a lot of the imagery is you know, tied or blocked or, or constrained in some way. Um, again, I'm still interested in color, but I've kept the color palette much more subdued because I think the issues are so serious. And I've also worked with imagery, this is Sandra Bland, uh, many people may know the video, um, imagery that I don't entirely feel comfortable with, but the issue is so serious and important that I felt like I couldn't just, you know, leave it out. Um, so I, I started looking for, at, the, at first I was saying, this is a neat image, and I can put this onto my work, and it, it kind of makes sense. But by the end of putting together this set of work, this installation of pieces, I was starting to say, okay, how do I deal with the bigger issue? How do I bring that imagery in and not necessarily have it, you know, have it still be something that's interesting to look at? So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm presenting this at a very midpoint, I feel, 
Um, I have images that, pieces that I think <coughs> have worked more successfully and ones I'm still kind of trying to figure out how do I address this issue. But when I put these pieces together <coughs> in an installation, right now they're up in, in a show in Oregon and there's 60 of them up together. And uh, the pieces then interact with each other and tell a story where this imagery is your issue and this imagery is your issue, but together they, they hopefully interact and hopefully the people looking at the show might be coming into it from different pieces and like I recognize this, but I'm not sure about this one, what this one is, and so they ha start to have a conversation with each other. So I'm interested to see where this, where this goes in the next year. Thank you. So uh, this is guided for me by a question. How can we learn from and honor the traditions of Native women ceramicists as a way to combat colonialism while engaged in a respectful contemporary practice? And I think that this question led me to a lot of other questions, um, including um, you know, what does it mean to have a respectful practice? How have Native women been traditionally viewed uh, in, in uh, society and even within the field of ceramics? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, this is not the most updated version. Should I just, I'm just, I'm just gonna go with it. <laughs> um, so as I pondered this question, I realized that the key word is respectful and that led me to a host of other questions. Um, I'm still seeking answers to. So um, how, are we tr how are we treating Native people? Um, how are they othered? Uh, what is the tendency for appropriation as opposed to, uh, like I said, honoring the beliefs and giving credit and full recognition for their contributions in our field? And then how many publications in our field are included, including Native women specifically? So uh, I'm gonna start uh, with this quote by Linda Tuhiwai. Um, Indigenous women have been objectified, commodified, described, represented, and other differently by Europeans. This has left them marginalized within their own societies as well as within the society of the colonizers. So um, my story begins in Lamas, Peru, in the Amazon jungle, and with the Quechua Waiku women ceramicists. These women have been teaching their daughters uh, this art form for countless generations, a relationship to the land and to the clay that, uh, that they themselves dig out is different from any I had previously understood. So how does the relationship of place, and sh uh, of place shape our experience? They view ceramics and making as an integral part of their culture and their place. So uh, the studio in ceramics, um, it's a studio in a ceramic store in Lamas uh, where my teacher Manuela works and teaches classes. It's called El Anuje. It is built in the traditional style with a thatched roof uh, made out of palm fronds. Manuela is very, uh, very fond of the geckos that live in the roof uh, that she said always kept like the bugs out. Um, and so uh, the style of building is much more effective in keeping cool in a, in a tropical climate than modern styles, and it's actually really excellent for drying ceramics uh, in a really, really wet tropical climate. So um, when walking around Lamas, I would see these clumps of clay lying on the street, and Manuela knows uh, where the highest quality clay is, and also uh, the colored clay she used to make angobes. She grinds her own uh, shanyu, which is grog in Quechua, out of pieces that didn't come out of the firing the way she wanted. And then uh, basically these clay rocks that she digs out are uh, soaked under cover for several days in a batea, a wooden platter after being mixed with shanyu and even out with bare feet. So that's what you could see there. So um, this is Manuela, my teacher, working in her studio. Although she was very coy about her age, she has been working with clay for over 30 years uh, since she was a girl is what she said. Uh, she's one of the leaders in the Quechua Waiku community. They build exclusively with coil using plantain peels as ribs to smooth the work, and the resin actually um, seeks, uh, seeps into the clay and strengthens the clay body. And um, here we are making tinajas, and these are vessels for drinking. And even with a rasp, which I smuggled in, um, I could never get my wall, the walls of my tinajas as thin or as even or smooth as Manuela's. 
So uh, when my time with Manila was coming to a close, she told me that she didn't want to use the regular pit to fire the work. She wanted to teach me the traditional way of firing. Um, they do not glaze and bisque separately because ongoves don't require uh, two firing. So this process involved a pre-fire and candling of the greenware slowly over several hours with hot coals. This was followed uh, by a pyramid bonfire with the pieces stacked in the middle in the hottest, but also the most even temperature part of the fire. And so once they were red hot, they were removed from the fire and with a metal pole and led to cool in a tin roof. And at that time, I did not know how I'd come to use all of what I had learned with Manuela. So um, after my time in Lamas, I flew to Lima to make work for a two-person exhibition with Peruvian photographer and childhood, my childhood friend, Samuel Chambi. I had been making work with an extruder for about a year at this point um, and using the geometry of pre-Columbian Peruvian architecture from cities like Chanchan to build abstract forms. Um, and so um, the most amazing thing happened, actually. Um, everything went wrong. So um, at least uh, unexpected, at, at least unexpected things started happening. So my time in Lamas had pushed me in a new direction and glazing my work uh, no longer worked. Uh, the form had changed significantly. Um, I realized that what I needed to do was to bonfire, to fire in this way that um, my own ancestors had fired and let the elements kind of determine the surface of my artwork instead of me controlling the surface. And uh, this, works, this work was presented alongside small ceramic tiles with Champi's photographs, uh, developed with liquid emulsion, which you can see alongside the wall, a fusion of ceramics and photography. So Narraciones Fragmentarias was a link to the past and also a blending of organic and geometric of industrial age extrusion and traditional firing of contemporary and also ancient processes. So even Manuela, with all of her years of experience, warned me about uh, pieces cracking in a bonfire. I am Peruvian-American, multiracial, and Quechua, but also a global citizen. Before firing, I decided to use the philosophy behind Japanese kintsugi to honor the history of the object, and in my case, that uh, the ways in which the fire stained the surface and broke the work. I realized I could maintain my own Quechua heritage along, alive along with, Quechua, with the Quechua haiku, even while working with other techniques. So uh, maintaining those traditions alive is something Manuela discussed every day. She understood erasure and how it impacts even her small community. Um, and so I have this quote, for the settlers, indigenous peoples are in the way and in the destruction of indigenous peoples and indigenous communities. And over time and through law and policy, indigenous peoples claims to land under solid regimes, land is recast as property uh, and as a resource. Indigenous peoples must be erased, must be made into ghosts. So uh, by using traditions, I refuse to let them become ghosts, and now I'm keeping those traditions alive. It gets between 600 and 800 in the center of the fire. So uh, now in my final year of a Master of Fine Arts in Ceramics, I decided to push uh, further by including my own contemporary version of Quipus, a Peruvian writing uh, and data recording device used for thousands of years before the Spanish burned uh, so many that their codes remain undecipherable. Choosing two uh, knots randomly, I used ASCII binary code to write messages about my identity. And in the installation, I included a found curio cabinet as a metaphor for the colonial lens. I have often seen Quipus in cabinets with a vague cultural reference and without any context. They were not only stolen from their land and culture, uh, they are diminished while their people are marginalized. The conflict over the American continent has uh, shaped my identity, and as I seek to understand all of the sources of um, my origin and who I am, I also include those sources in my process. As this draws to a close, I want to read an excerpt from my written thesis that accompanies this body of work. I am the child of my Quechua ancestors, but I'm also a Latin American woman living in a racialized American society. My identity and my artwork are influenced by those experiences as, as well. I have brown skin, I wear it everywhere I go. It cannot be removed or underscored. I can, uh, I can never blend in, um, never pretend I belong. Every time a stranger asks me where I am from, especially aggressively, I understand the hidden message. You are not from here, you don't belong here, we don't want you here, this is not your home. In my head, all I can hear is YCE, mi casa, the American continent is my home. Where are you from, colonial settler? I am from Dulce Quilcha, El Valle Sagrado, the Sacred Valley of the Incas. I am from the genocide of my ancestors. I am from the Europeans that murdered them, stole their lands, 
and exploit Pachamama and their resources to this day. Miski Sake, I am something new and old, a walking, living, breathing embodiment of the conflict over the American continent, and I'm here to stay. So um, I just wanted to end with a picture of Manuela's work. Uh, we can honor um, other traditions uh, and the traditions of those that came before us. Thank you. for coming. Can you hear me okay? I'm Sarah Gross. Um, I'm an assistant professor of ceramics at the University of Kansas, and I'm going to begin by reading you the statement for my piece, Continental Drift. <coughs> this installation offers a space for meandering and contemplation. It is inspired by the geometric tile work of Islamic architecture, pays tribute to the artisans of handmade ceramics, and treats blue and white ceramics as carriers of ideas. The visual tradition of blue and white ceramics develops through an exchange beginning in the ninth century between the Middle East and China and has taken on many forms and embodied many geographic identities. Allow your eye to drift from the individual forms to the larger form, from independent pattern to interconnected pattern. Experience the lack of resolution. I invite viewers to explore the work and fill the voids they see with projected patterns and personal memories. Continental Drift has been installed at three different galleries in three different states. The Riston Art Center at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, the Leedy Volkis Art Center in Kansas City, and the Stevens Gallery at the University of the Ozarks in Clarksville, Arkansas. The installation is composed of 1,050 stoneware tiles, press molded, carved, and hand painted. Each tile rests upon three wooden stilts to cast shadows and make the viewer more thoughtful and attentive to their movement through the space. I designed grouping of groupings of tiles as a response to blue and white ceramics from a variety of traditions, and sometimes drawing inspiration from a very specific object. I have included some slides of the tiles paired with source images. I used a combination of hand-painted surfaces and decals applied to the tops of the two-inch thick tiles. The tiles are coarse and pitted, and the painting is informal. The evidence of the hand is important to me. Italian maiolica, American folk pottery, Delftware, Ming Dynasty porcelain, Iznik, these traditions inspire so much awe in me. The relative crudeness is a gesture of humility. We'll take some time to look at a couple more details. The installation is packed in about 90 cardboard boxes and weighs about one and a half tons. Every step in the process of making and showing this piece takes a lot of planning and help. I often find myself asking why I make large ceramic installations when it comes to moving days, but I have learned a lot over the three installations of this piece. First of all, this is a group effort. We begin by unpacking all of the tiles sorting them and spreading them out across the gallery. I assign students, friends, and volunteers a grouping of tiles to work with, a general area to work within, and a shape to build out to. And I direct them in balancing the tiles on the wooden posts as we would place kiln shelves on kiln stilts. The tiles have idiosyncrasies and it takes time to place them. I love seeing how engaged people become in this activity. It can be intense and frustrating, like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And I have seen some people jump up in exasperation or refuse to take a break until they have set up their entire group. 
When it's all over, participants have a sense of investment and pride in the completed piece. It is different every time it is installed. So I've shown you images of how groups of people come together to install continental drift. Now I will show you more about the process of making the work, which was also a group effort. The installation was quite low tech to make. I sculpted a solid clay form as a prototype and poured plaster over it to make a mold. I used about a dozen molds. Once I released the tiles from the molds, I cut a shape through the center and hollowed out the underside. From conception to production and experimentation at multiple stages, Continental Drift took a year to complete. I was fortunate to work in a supportive community at a small liberal arts college, Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, when I made the piece, and friends and colleagues from across the campus came to the studio to help me, including almost the entire faculty of the chemistry department. <laughs> when thinking back on all of the individuals who have assisted with the many steps of this process, I lose count at about 50 people. There are dozens of people who have been a part of this piece. As a side note, one of my favorite images of the piece, which reflects the map-like quality better than I ever could have planned, was photographed by my friend Rachel with a drone. This piece is a reflection of how trade and industry have impacted the world of ceramics, but it is defined for me by the people who have participated in its production and installation and who continue to contribute as it finds new audiences. My goal is for the viewer to stroll through continental drift, feeling wary of knocking something over, pausing and seeing something re they recognize, something they identify with, and appreciating its place within the larger world. And that's the end. Hi, I'm Tiffany Leach, and I'm an artist and educator um, in Jacksonville, Florida, in Northeast Florida, um, at Jacksonville University. I'm presenting today on navigating transitions within a body or bodies of work. Uh, this presentation is Collections and Balance, Figuring Out This Life One Body of Work at a Time. I've always found, um, I've always defined my work as both personal and universal, but mostly the latter. In my early works, I had grand themes such as meditation and prayer that later moved into a more narrative style of uh, storytelling. Um, prior to making this figurative work, my focus was on the vessel, and I was using the figure as a metaphor. Over the course of about six years, I realized that I needed to make a transition in the work in order to really tell the stories I was trying to find. Um, and I found freedom in doing this once I made this transition. I now bounce between two or three series of works at a time with overlapping features, and this presentation will narrate some of the pieces and the correlation between the bodies of work. The next few images are examples of work that came about during and after the story I'm going to tell. The catalyst of this transition was becoming a parent. It's a hot September day in Florida. We're visiting the doctor to celebrate a checkup for the first year of life. We had survived that first year of life with a child. Uh, it's something that you're never really sure you're gonna be able to do. It's a sense of survival and pride when you get there. The doctor comes in for the checkup. They're uh, going through everything and they do a cleaning of the ear and they use this tiny tool that looks like a scraffito tool, um, which kind of is, is interesting. And as they clean out this wax buildup in the ear, and I found myself looking at it thinking how beautiful it was, how rich in color it was, and how I kind of wanted to keep it, even though that's disgusting. Um, <laughs> days later in my studio, I was reflecting on this. Why did I feel this need to collect these objects? And so I started researching um, the idea of saving obje objects, so objects for association with the sake of memory, uh, parent-child dynamic, and uh, mother-daughter dynamic, uh, marital relationships, and I, and to say the least, my work made a huge transition from this time. Um, I went from these meditative vessels into these personal objects and experiences, and uh, even though that was kind of undertones in my work before, it really took becoming a parent and that adventure to push me into making these huge leaps. The current work is influenced both by the 
um, examining of our roles as individuals in relationships as well as a social persona we publicize in these fragmented moments in time. In this piece, Mother's Collection, uh, it has titles such as Sunday Night Tangle, Sunburn of 1994, and Build Up. And this was a change of pace in my personal work, and this was not intended to be made for an audience, but for myself. But I found that so many others relate to this need to collect and save for the sake of memory that it found an audience. I wanted to find a way for Mother's Collection to make a sense in the grander scheme of my body of work. This began to happen as I allowed more personal aspects of my work, such as um, pieces like this titled Between Two Spawns and Making Peace. Um, the imagery is taken um, directly from my reflections on relationships and interactions. I've really enjoyed this research and this dialogue and it's opened conversations about um, how others relate to my work and into their own sacred moments in life. Uh, it's also open dialogue about that actual balance of family life, studio practice, and a tenure track position. And I'll circle back to that in just a moment. This current body of work titled Narrative Compilations, I define this work as self-reflective and strive to capture the essence of internal dialogue while preserving and revealing fragmentations of our memory. Pictured here is a detail from the work titled Full Heart. Another example, the weight of it all and everyone sees, there is a direct correlation with the idea of balancing multiple roles. I use three round forms on the head of the figure to represent these multiple roles I'm currently juggling. Visually, I'm using lines to represent conversations of thought and feeling, moving and transforming from head and heart, a continuous conversation. The image depicted um, here uses my hybrid forms, often resulting in large scale um, figurative compilations, animals with human personifications, and small scale work that has intimate spaces. This combination creates a scale that offers both a perspective of intimacy and vastness within an environment and within a relationship. And I, it's within this description that I found freedom in justifying my bodies of work. An inspiration is the late and amazing Betty Woodman who once said, you should understand each time I have a new opportunity, it gives me permission to go ahead and do something new. I take away from this quote, as an artist, we need to continually evolve. This piece titled, Sharing the Burden and Reward, encompasses a number of visual vocabulary that have been repeating in my work over the years. From the throne col column base to the rock formations of literal landscapes, the figure and the balance of energetic line quality, this creates the correlation between works from a one series to the next. This image titled, All I Have for an Offering, captures the idea of micro expressions that is often forgotten, but can define the preservation of a memory. Again, referencing vocabulary from other work, the imagery in all of my work can be categorized as depicting the nuances of life, small moments we as humans try to preserve. And circling back to that dialogue about the literal balance in life, I found encouragement from female artists like Kara Walker who have opened up about her discussions with maternal balance, ceramicist Kate Fisher of the website Both Mother and Artist, and the book Academic Motherhood in a Post-Second Wave Context. All of these amazing women and so many more balance the very roles I'm narrating in this work. My advice to someone ready to make general transitions in their work, spend time with it, connect the dots from one piece to the next, take time to hash out uh, the concepts and the relationships between each piece as you're going, and this will have allow you to have a stronger understanding of what it is that you want out of the work. Self-reflect and allow art and life to be a reflection of one another. I have found that when I am honest with my work and that I work from an honest place, that this experience shows through whether it's narrative or non-representational and others will relate to that. In conclusion, transitions in your work show growth, Sometimes in life you are faced with defining moments that transition your work and other times it just happens so slowly you don't even realize you've made those transitions. But either way, both are valid and my re recommendation is to just embrace it and keep making. Thank you. Hi, Linda. <laughs> All right, so my name is Marshall Maud, and I teach, at, I teach with Sarah at the University of Kansas. And my talk is going to basically focus on this exhibition that you see here that was uh, installed at the Leedy Volkus Art Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, I'd just like to thank the Leedy Volkus and also all, all the volunteers here at Nsika, Cindy Brocker, who put this together. The title of my talk and my exhibition was Look, Look Again. And when I was 
trying to decide about a, a title for the show. I was driving down in the country outside my house, and I saw this sign, and I was like, that is just the weirdest sign in the world. And it's like an invitation, but it's also like, okay, is it a direction? Is it an invitation? Is it just simply to take a look again, or is it more metaphorical, and it, can it be deeper? So in this exhibition, I decided to, I've been sort of dancing around the vessel with my work for a long time, but this time I decided to take it on directly. So most of the work that you see has either a direct or indirect uh, you know, discussion about the vessel. These, these are thrown forms. Um, Rachel's talk on laser cutting just in the beginning was really informative. So these pieces are all laser cut, and uh, where you're fusing the material, this is just etching right into the glaze itself. These are wood-fired forms, and so this is a this is a Greek, uh, so I'm referencing pots, and they're a little hard to see, but that one was a Greek black on red ware. This is a Native American uh, vase, and then the next one is uh, a Chinese dragon vase, similar to the one that Sar Sarah showed in her slides. And so, uh, I mean, one thing that this does for me, it's pretty easy. I mean, it's not all that complicated in the sense that I'm taking a really old material, a really old process, um, most of these are wood-fired um, forms that you'll see, and so you have all the ancient traditions of the wood-firing process, and then you have this completely new technique, this new process that is giving us the opportunity to make marks that have never been made before and our hands can't actually do. One of the things that's interesting with the laser-firing process, it's not just, it's not like sandblasting. Sometimes they actually change the surface of the glaze because of the heat that's involved with it, so you can actually reactivate the glaze and change the colors and the surface of the piece, depending on, and it has, and when you're doing it on a wood-fired surface, I'm on two amphoras. So um, I, made these, I made these amphora forms as the title of this piece is Retrace, and I was thinking to myself, okay, I'm interested in the history of ceramics. That was, that's really what drives sort of my interest, but I was thinking about, it's not so much the exact history of it as our connections to people from the past and connections to people from the future. And so it's been a real honor to hear these people's talk today that we just saw because it, a lot of this is similar. What we do is as similar as artists. What all you guys do is really similar. So like my audience and the people that I speak to is like, you guys all know this, you know what I mean? The process that we have, the connection to clay as makers, we understand this in a really fundamental level. But when you put this work in a gallery and you expose it to people who aren't clay people, who aren't maybe even artists or anything else. This kind of information translates and carries through from my experience. Um, surfaces of out of the wood kiln, I'm using these surfaces really because they just imbue the pieces with a sense of time and history. Um, the forms, even though these forms are ancient forms, they were shipping vessels for wine and this, that, and the other. Um, and they're the, they're the, the earliest examples of amphoras I was ex uh, surprised to hear were actually in China from almost 7,000 years ago. And so like the similarity of forms that we make, but then also the subtle differences when you work in a way that is repetitive in the sense that I threw, I tried to imagine myself as a, as a, as a Roman potter, you know, like this kind of funny imagination that that I have this connection to other people in the past, but then I also think about the connections that we have with each other. And I think, especially in this time, in this day and age, it's like the more we can understand our similarities as humans, the, m the more, I think, the, the better off we can be. Um, so these pieces are, they're also laser etched, and but there's a real simple either circle or ellipse. And I, I use the circle or the ellipse a lot in my work just to represent like an infinite timeline. There's no beginning, there's no end to a circle. And um, you know, we sort of all understand, I mean, I think it's really interesting that like the most fundamental questions that we have in this world are like unanswerable. But uh, I think about, you know, just my work as just being a physical representation of just like this search. Um, so like, you know, you know the, the beginning of life, the end, and it's just like the repetitiveness of all of our similar situations. Um, so these are, you know, these panels are these panels are 20 by 30 inches, and I made them that size because that's how big our laser cutter is at University of Kansas. You know, so uh, there's some thought that goes into that. Um, <laughs> deciding that. Let's see here. It's slowing down. But anyway, uh, also, I've, you know, this is 
this is sort of a monolithic piece. It's about 48 inches tall, and so this is not exactly a reference to the vessel, but it's the same thing that's like we're part of a larger whole, so I titled this piece Remnant, and I, wa I like the idea of it, it of, or feeling like it's being, it's a part of a larger whole, and uh, these pieces were just, you know, sometimes I go in the studio and I just make, you know, I just like to touch stuff. I'm a builder, and uh, these pieces are about 32 inches wide, and I was thinking about symmetry and pattern, and these are all the same. Theoretically, they're made out of the same mold or made into the same mold, but they're all different. They all have, some of them are symmetrical, some of them are intentionally asymmetrical. And, uh, you know, so, so hopefully when the viewer sees this, they can understand that, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm trying to get people to think, yeah, we're all different. You know, I mean, like a, if you think about like a snowflake or a fingerprint, it's just an amazing thing um, as an identifier of differences. But then like the fundamental uh, reality is we're all basically the same. So there's my website. You can check out some more stuff if you want. And uh, thanks a lot. If you guys have any questions or we have a booth downstairs, universitykansas.com, come see us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Luke Sheets, and I'm an associate professor of art and design at Ohio Northern University. While the majority of my work is functional wood-fired work, I've been working with slipcast assemblages for several years now. This body of work has allowed me to more direct, a more direct way of engaging with the strange and often contrary trends in current American popular culture. My process started out as an innocent exploration of assembling cast pieces seeing what, pits, uh, what parts fit into each other, and then reacting to the assemblages. Seeing Barry Bartlett demonstrate at Bowling Green State University in 2010 also helped guide these explorations. I also found that using commercial molds with their readily accessible imagery provided me an easily accessible shorthand to connect with the viewers and convey meaning. Uh, this piece, Academia, is a reaction yeah. to faculty <laughs> governance and dealing with administrative decision making. <laughs> My university's mascot is the polar bear. We have five colleges. Um, parallel with this, I was making my own prototypes and plaster molds. Um, I can't remember if I intended to make a copy of the Venus of Vilni Vishniste for this piece or if I had made it for another purpose and then decided that it needed a contemporary friend, you know, a reaction to the portrayal of body image in advertising. Uh, also thinking of the work of neuroscientists such as Dr. V. S. Ramachandran, who state that the visual cue that excites us, excites us even more when it's exaggerated. Uh, I, I called this piece 30,000 years, but my wife saw it and said, thigh gap versus back fat. Uh, innocent assemblages started for the simple purpose of amusing myself in the studio uh, can also take on meaning as our reality changes. Primary, fired in 2014, does just that after the 2016 presidential election cycle and the first years of this administration. Uh, prophetic in a way, uh, the fool with the power, the symbols of power, freedom, Americana, sitting back and joyfully watching the chaos that comes from his words and actions. Bigly. Uh, <laughs> Altering the castings from these commercial molds has allowed for more variety of expression. The we're number one hand with minor modification becomes a much stronger and combative <laughs> statement. I've always liked displaying multiples of things. Uh, the relationship between the objects helped to guide the viewer and frame the conversation. Uh, again, in the wake of the 2016 election cycle, civil discourse has all but evaporated. With the plethora of news outlets tailored to whatever political view you may hold, it's hard to talk with somebody whose views differ from yours. The feedback loop that forms from hearing the same view over and over again leads to knee-jerk dismissal and uh, of ideas that differ from what you're used to being spoon-fed. 
Uh, that last piece was Midwest Political Discourse in Arbor Mayer. Uh, I also collect new molds to work into the vocabulary I use for these pieces. I have my students cut pieces from castings and use many pieces from different molds to assemble into new compositions. This is where the Icons of the Faith series was born, combining the two disparate symbols of the praying hands and the revolver into one icon that sums up the hot topics portrayed in the media. My God and my guns. Peace, love, and forgiveness versus the need for self-defense, i.e. my right to shoot you. So, nestled in its own reliquary, we have the simple pine version for the more pious believer, or for those that like the finer things and knows that God wants them to have those things as well. We have the solid oak deluxe model. <laughs> more recent manifestations of this imagery look at choice or the illusion of choice between the limited choices that are given. These limited black and white dualities are binary choices in a hexadecimal reality. Whether the choices are given by the left or the right, or Morpheus's question of the red pill or the blue pill, it's all like Frost's choosing of the road less traveled. In the end, it doesn't matter. We all end up at the same place anyway. This lack of choice, coupled with the inability to communicate with one another, only furthers our resistance to the other, leading to the overwhelming th conviction that my belief is the correct one. Anything that differs from that is a threat, aberrant, and must be opposed. My belief is more important than your facts. My ignorance is as valid as your knowledge. Uh, to quote Frank Herbert, when religion and politics travel in the same cart, the writer believes nothing can stand in their way. Their movements come headlong, faster and faster and faster. They put aside all thoughts of obstacles and forget the precipice does not show itself to the man in a blind rush until it's too late. Um, working in the studio, I've caught glimpses of my students looking at each other meaningfully and nodding in my direction as I assemble these pieces. They are surprised, maybe shocked. Good. That's what I hope for. I want to illustrate. I want, other, I want to make others aware, even to provoke. I want to have someone disagree with me. I hope as this work, I hope this work can restart some of the much needed conversations that have stopped. Thank you.